Hi, my name is Peter Vida, and today I'm going to explain a contradiction inherent to the Euler-Bernoulli beam theory. To begin, let's start by picturing this simple scenario. It's a beam built in at one end and being acted upon by force P at the other end. Now consider the beam is broken up into a series of infinitesimally small cubes. Well, this would indicate there'd be almost innumerable cubes. For simplicity's sake, I've limited this picture to only showing 10. This beam has a square cross-section, so its neutral axis, the point where neither tension nor compression occurs during bending, is located in the middle. Now let's consider the effects of the transverse shear force tau yx upon one of the infinitesimal cubes. The two subscripts attached to tau indicate where and in which direction the force is acting. The y, that it is normal to the y-axis, and the x, that it is pointed in the x-direction. Since there's no transverse loading in this scenario, tau yx equals zero. Now that we've set up a baseline scenario, we can start to examine the effects that force P will have as it begins to bend the beam upwards. As you can see here, the lines that indicate the points where our infinitesimal cubes meet all remain perpendicular to the neutral axis. This is the central assumption of the Euler-Bernoulli beam theorem, that any plane perpendicular to the neutral axis before bending will remain so after the beam is bent. However, the lines aren't really perpendicular to the neutral axis because they're not really lines at all. Since the beam, as we're choosing to represent it, is made up of infinitesimally small cubes, which we're choosing to then represent as squares, the region above the neutral axis is actually one where the squares slightly overlap and the region below it is one where they're slightly separated. Now that suggests, when we go back to looking at just one infinitesimal cube, that there actually is a tau yx force. Since the squares in real life are cubes of material and they can't overlap, the top half, where there is an overlap, is being pushed away, out from the built-in end of the beam, and since forces come in pairs, the bottom half is being pulled back towards the built-in end. Now, while this tau yx actually exists, it really is so small that it doesn't really make a difference. Euler Bernoulli still applies here because the angular distortion that is caused by this tau yx force is so small it's negligible compared to the bending deformation of the whole beam. A problem only arises with this theory when the bending becomes much more pronounced. Let's take a look at this example. Here, when we zoom in, you can clearly see how the squares are overlapping. This then indicates that there is another tau yx force, and this time it really is too big to just keep considering negligible. The end result of adding all of those tiny tau yx forces acting on infinitesimally small cubes is this, a beam where the end really isn't even close to being perpendicular to the neutral axis anymore. When we zoom in, we see that the angle at the end of the beam with the neutral axis is much greater than 90. And this is the contradiction in the Euler-Bernoulli theorem. We can see by visual inspection, and the fact that the angle is much greater than 90, that there has been some form of strain along the top and bottom edges of the beam because it's changed shape. However, the Euler-Bernoulli theorem doesn't allow for this because it's, as part of the theorem, tau yx has to be equal to zero. And all of the planes that were originally perpendicular, i.e. the end of the beam, have to remain perpendicular after bending. This leaves us at an impasse. The answer to this impasse lies with looking at another beam theory. This is called the Timoshenko beam theory, and the beam that I've been showing you with the non-perpendicular end is the Timoshenko beam. The Timoshenko theory accounts for the effects of transverse shear deformation, and thus is a more accurate representation of true bending in a beam that's bent this severely. However, most beams don't bend this much, and the Euler-Bernoulli theory has a long history of being used successfully. It was used to build the Eiffel Tower, and the first Ferris wheels were made possible because of its discovery. In practice, it's more than accurate enough for most beam modeling situations. Compared to the Timoshenko theory, the Euler-Bernoulli theory underestimates deflection because it models a stiffer beam. Because of that, beams that are either short or have large expected deflections are better off being modeled with the Timoshenko theory. Alright, that's all I have. Thank you so much for listening.